What's up, YouTube? It's your boy, Anime Princess, and today I'm back for 3.24 with a brand new Spark League starter built completely from the ground up, specifically for an Acropolis League. This time around, we're going to be using the Hierophant Ascendancy as well as leveraging the Widow Hail Bow to hit an easy 400% increased projectile speed on a League starting budget. This is by far the most projectile speed I've ever included in a Spark build and will be more than enough to overcompensate for any nerf that GGG can throw at us. As for what you can expect, we're still going to have the standard detailed leveling notes to get through the entire campaign, and this will be followed up with four truly distinct endgame passive tree skill set and gear sets. And the final gear set, the gear is going to cost probably no more than a maximum of five divines per gear slot, if not much cheaper, possibly with the exception of a very good watcher's eye. So the scope of this video is still, in my opinion, pretty least art friendly. And that final skill tree is the one where you are going to hit greater than 400% projectile speed, as well as a spark hit of roughly 3 million damage. Per single hit however since we just have ludicrous amounts of projectile speed you're going to do high multiples of the damage depending on what kind of map or arena you're in let's move the discussion onto why you might want to pick spark for your league starter i think there are three distinct tiers that a skill can fall under which get progressively worse in terms of playability the top tier are skills where you do not have to aim to kill stuff and this is great because you don't have to worry about your mouse movement in order to kill enemies. You're just moving your mouse to pick up loot and move through the map. This is A tier and stuff like Tornado Shot, Spark, Auto Bombers fall in this category. One tier below that are skills where you have to aim in a direction, but it kills everything in that direction. So that would be stuff like Lightning Arrow. Um... I shot maybe ball lightning to some degree. I don't know. It's just you're just aiming and it goes off the screen, kills everything there. And the absolute worst would be skills where you have to click on an enemy to kill them. So that's stuff like poison concoction, toxic rain, traps if they have low radius. And this is bad because now you're just constantly flicking your wrist forward to click on the enemy you want to kill. And then you have to move your wrist around, move the mouse where you want to walk. And it's just, it destroys your hand. I, I refuse to play those skills. So Spark is top tier in terms of its playability. I'd say that's one of the biggest strengths of the skill. The second strength would be the scalability. Spark is one of the best scalers in the game. It's a good choice if you are a one build per league type of player. The skill will scale basically endlessly. You will never run out of runway and you will feel the impact of every single upgrade. And they just keep coming where basically most people, including myself, will have to choose a point where we just say this build is done. We're no longer spending any more money because there's always going to be another carrot you can chase. Now, a third strength of Spark is the gear is somewhat flexible. So even if a unique such as Widow Hail ends up being a little bit expensive on day one or two. There are some alternative budget uniques that we can fall back on, which we will go on later in the unique section of the video. I guess the final thing to say would be, I will be playing this build live on Twitch on League Start and we'll be making daily content updates so you can follow along in real time. And I do plan on taking this build much further than the scope of the League Start video. So you can expect to receive full support in terms of build progression and guides that extend quite far in terms of scope and budget. There are associated weaknesses with all these strengths. The biggest one being that this is not a racing build and you should not go into the league expecting to bum rush the Eater and Exarch boss fights. To help visualize this, the most recent video on my channel is a full league start run in SSF to show what your day one will ideally look like. Spark is pretty good for going through the campaign, but the skill does benefit a lot from gearing. So I advise you at level 60 to start doing chaos recipe and heist 
it is done in the video so you can see exactly how that works. There are timestamps where I actually just click on the timestamp. I'm going to explain here. I'm starting to do my chaos orb farming and then you'll see how I do it. I would highly advise farming a six link just to get a lot of power to make the transition into maps and then the transition into killing those bosses very smooth. Um, in my opinion, spending a few hours farming a lot of chaos orbs instead of just rushing straight through the end game mapping system is a small price to pay for all the strengths associated with Spark. So, you know, just <laughs> I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. Just keep in mind you are going to have a slightly different progression curve than some of the pro racers. Let's talk about the build's defenses. This is not a hardcore viable build. In lower budgets, we will want to make use of highly efficient defensive layers such as the spell suppression is lucky mastery. We'll be going for a defensive body armor such as lightning coil and that coupled with endurance charges will be our main fizz mitigation and we'll be scaling evasion to avoid most of the hits. However, due to the way this build is structured, in order to scale the evasion quite high, you will have to get a lot of that on gear as well as on skill gems. So stuff like Dread Banner, getting blind on hit from a large cluster, and possibly spending the currency to get the evade chance on Watcher's Eye, those are all going to be key components of your early investments. Now for defenses, we also use cold damage to freeze and chill enemies, and that's going to be pretty big. Our projectiles are going to go so fast off the screen that basically everything's going to be frozen all the time. And we can leverage that defense into a lot of damage by making use of Trinity support. We're also going to hopefully get access to life leech, which you will have to get on gear. We'll talk about the various options to get that. And the ES leech is going to be gotten through the passive tree. This build uses Eldritch Battery with Mind Over Matter, so the Energy Shield Leech is going to be leeching our mana as well as contributing to our overall EHP pool. As for ailments, we will be wanting to eventually go for crafted ailment immunity boots, and there is going to be a video guide on the channel for how to craft this. It's not too expensive, but on our way to those boots, you're going to want to make use of Brian King for the Pantheon, and possibly even dropping an aura for purity of elements if your resistances are a little bit low. That's an option for you. I've tried to balance the defense as well as the damage in this guide using efficient forms of defenses while not going to overkill where it makes us ZDPS. And you can tweak that as well yourself if you're not happy with the amount of each that I've chosen. Moving on to the leveling notes section of this video, which is here to ensure you have smooth sailing through your entire league start. This is a path to building file, which you can find linked in the video description and you can open it yourself using the program path building community fork. We have incorporated a note section, which has the most important information on how to progress your skill gems. Now I don't like to make a whole story in here. So everything is basically as brief as possible while still giving required context if you want it in these little uh, sentences in yellow. So we'll be going through this and we're also going to be going through all the different skill trees. We have progression based skill trees and a drop down menu in the bottom left hand. So we can just use the mouse wheel to scroll through them and you'll see the build grow and grow and grow until the final tree right here. And every single one of these skill tree progressions is going to be accompanied by a skill gem progression, as well as an item set progression. So you can always match the gear with the associated uh, passive tree. And this is going to start to matter once we get into the end game past all the leveling. But let's just start off by walking through the leveling process. So we're going to start off actually by looking at the note section because we don't start with this tree. Note section says act one ranger start. 
So we're actually going to be making a ranger as our first character. We're going to play around 10 minutes on the ranger because ranger has access to some skill gems that are really powerful that you can't get unless you choose the ranger class. So we're going to make our ranger. And this is to mule momentum support, which we get in the very first zone before we kill Hillock. The next gem we want is Pierce Support, which we get as a quest reward for killing Hailrake, which is the first quest. And the last gem we want is Sniper's Mark, which we get from grabbing all the Roa eggs and then opening the passage to the next zone. So we're going to grab those three skill gems. Oh, it's only going to take around 10 minutes. And uh, while you're on this character, you're going to want to use this code right here, copy paste it into the vendor to check his items. And this is going to highlight items of interest. So we're looking for movement speed boots as well as some specific link colors. The nice thing about having two characters is that you're going to have two separate vendors, which will make it much more likely you'll find these early game items you can buy than if you just had one. All right, so all that being done, we're going to put these items and these gems in your stash tab, then you can just log out and make our Templar. So you're going to make a Templar. Up here, I have a note that says favor using scepters over wands. And this is because we're going to be using Leap Slam as our movement skill from Act 2 until the end of the campaign. And in order to do this, we're going to want to have a scepter in one hand and either a sword or an axe in your other hand. So keep that in mind. All right, so on our Templar, we're going to path out through this damage. And then we're going to right away go for the Dexterity node down here, which also gives us cast speed because we just grabbed a bunch of green gems from Ranger that need the Dexterity. After we path through this, we're just going to grab all the nodes down here. It gives us a lot of damage, a lot of life, a lot of resistances. We're going to work our way up here. And we're going to path and grab both of these nodes. Now, this is important, and I want to touch on this. These work while dual wielding two different weapons. Well, I mean, these will just work while dual wielding. So these just work innately. But the mastery is 60% increased damage when you have the scepter and then the axe or the sword. So that is why you need to have scepter and then axe or sword. This is a 60% is a lot of damage. So this is a lot of damage coming through here. It opens up the elemental inversion mastery. That's the reason we go through here. This mastery is very powerful. If you need some dex or strength, this is where we're going to grab it. And you probably will. We're going to spec and grab Ellie overload, which gives us a massive amount of damage if we've crit recently. And innately, we're not going to have much crit. We're going to have like 6% chance. So this is not going to proc all the time, but it's still nice to have. And later on, we're going to be grabbing a little bit more crit while we get further into the leveling tree. And then this is going to be up all the time. We're going to get some life down here whenever you need it. Make sure you grab plus 50 to maximum life. And then this will let us fit in the auras more comfortably. Now, at some point in this progression, you're going to be doing your first lab, which is an Act 3. And when you go finish Kill Azaro, make sure you choose Hierophant, because we are a Hierophant this time around. In the past, we chose Inquisitor, but I think Hierophant is stronger for what we're trying to do. We're going to go ahead and grab Arcane Blessing, which is basically like a free damage link. It's quite nice. And then we're just going to grab some damage. And then up around this point, you're probably going to be at the Katava fight in Act 6. So we just went all the way from Act 1 to 6, which is quite far. Let's go through the notes section, because we have notes for every single one of these acts. All right, so we're at Act 1 on Templar. You're going to want to start off with Spark, Pierce Support, which we got from our Mule, and then Added Lightning, which we get from a Quest Reward. This is our three link. We're going to use Frost Blink as our movement skill. And we're going to couple that with Arcane Surge. And I have a note here that says, do not level your Arcane Surge. Remember, when it levels from level 2 to 3, just right click it and it will disappear from your leveled gems. And 
it'll just stay at that level. Um, we're going to use Frost Bomb. And going through the first few acts, you actually don't need to cast Spark to kill stuff. You can just Frost Bomb in front of you when there's a pack of monsters, and then you Frost Blink. And that way, you're not stopping to do cast any spells. The Frost Bomb damage coupled with the Frost Blink damage will destroy the pack behind you as you just keep running forward. That's a nice little trick. And I, I do, I think I already mentioned in this video earlier, but there is a complete League Start uh, SSF run on my channel. So if you want to see how this looks, just, you know, skim through the VOD and see what I'm doing. Um, Sniper's Mark. This is something we're only going to cast on like act bosses, basically. It amplifies our damage and you cast it once and it stays on them until either that enemy dies or you die. So it's quite easy to use. Holy Flame Totem is extremely powerful. You will not skip this. This will heal you if you're standing close to it. It gives quite a bit of extra damage and it actually works with Sniper's Mark. So Sniper's Mark is going to buff it even further. Um, and it's also a line of defense between you and the boss. So the boss is going to be hitting this totem instead of you. It's just overall S tier one link. Or flame wall, this is a skill you just throw on the ground, preferably underneath the boss. And as your sparks travel through it, they'll be ignited and then they'll do more damage. I have this in brackets as optional because we do have quite a few buttons already. We have more than enough damage. And this is something you could drop if you wanted. Orb of storms. Something you'll just stand in as you cast to do more damage. Again, this is optional in Act 1, but I would pick it up regardless if you plan on using it because we will be using this as one of our main utility damage links from Act 3 onwards. Next up is Clarity. This is us Aura. We're just going to keep leveling it as we go through the game. After our third lab, our mana issues will be solved and we can drop this, but up until then, you know, just keep, keep leveling up as you go. Leap Slam with Momentum Support. This is our main movement skill because there's no cooldown on Leap Slam. So we're going to be Leap Slamming and every once in a while Frost Blink is going to come off cooldown and you can animation cancel the Leap Slam to go super fast by doing a Frost Blink to propel yourself even further forward. So the gameplay will be like Leap Slam, Leap Slam, Leap Slam, Frost Blink and then just like repeat that. Steel Skin, this can no longer be used on left click. We will eventually be using this with, with automation support, so you can pick it up now if you want to. For Act 2, I do have a note which says favor heavy belts, which are going to start dropping. And this is because they have an implicit for plus 30 strength, and we will want the strength because we use quite a few strength gems. For bandits, you want to help Alira and kill the other two. Act 2 is going to give us some auras. You can choose, choose Herald of Thunder. This is nice because... It synergizes with the whole frost bomb, frost blink, in that once you get a few kills, you're just gonna get these lightning bolts. You keep running forward, the lightning bolts will start killing stuff with your frost bomb and your frost blink. Eventually, you are gonna want to drop this damage aura to sub in for Arctic Armor, and we can pick that up in Act 2 as well. From Act 3, I have a note that says favorite jade amulets from the quest reward. Jade Amulets give us Dex, which we sorely need. Also, in the Temple of Lunaris, you will unlock a prefix craft for lightning damage to spells. And this is something you are definitely going to want to grab. And you're going to want to immediately craft it on your scepter as well as your axe slash sword. This is a huge damage increase. It will carry you through the entire campaign. This craft costs four transmute orbs each, which means it's quite important through Act 1 and Act 2 to be picking up rare gear and vendoring it to get the shards back. If you can't afford this in Act 3, just remember, as soon as you do get the transmutes, go to your hideout, craft the lightning damage to spells. In Act 3, we will also be doing the library quest, and hopefully we'll have a few chance orbs because we want to use lightning penetration support, faster projectiles, as well as ice bite. And these cost orb a chance. Um, so yeah, we're going to have a four link of spark, pierce, lightning pen, and faster projectiles. Now, you might have access to these gems before you actually get a four link, but just keep in mind, this is a four link that will take us through the entirety of the rest of the campaign. 
orbistorms, elemental proliferation, and ice bite. So now this is going to be our main damage rotation. We're going to stop in front of enemy, cast orbistorms, and then shoot spark. And our spark is going to proc the orbistorms, which is going to freeze and shock the enemies. We're going to get frenzy charges. We're going to get a lot of damage from this. This is just a really powerful combo. This is going to, we're no longer going to be using frost bomb. You can drop the frost bomb out of our links. It's gone. Uh, we also have access to faster attacks, which is just better than momentum. So drop momentum for faster attacks. In the library, we'll pick up determination, and this will be our defensive aura for the rest of the campaign. Act four and act five have no notes because the gems don't change. So just cruise through those acts, get to the end of act five, kill Katava. Now you're on to act six. There's a note that says cap your elemental resistances right now. You do get quite a bit of alley resistance on the tree, so it shouldn't be too hard to do this, but make sure you teleport to your hideout and manually craft on your open suffixes to make sure you're 75 lightning, fire, and cold res. Um, we can go back to the passive tree now because we have finished all of this by now. Now we're going to move on to the tree that ends when you start lab two. So we've just recently grabbed these damage wheels here. This one's gonna give us some mana regen to help ease the burden off of clarity. If you want more mana regen, you can come down here for a lot of life and also mana regen. So this tanks us up, it helps the mana situation even more. This is very efficient damage going through here. And this is the crit I was talking about earlier that's gonna make sure our Ellie overload is proccing all of the time. There are some life nodes, and here is some resistances as well as attributes. Once you get to lab two, you're going to want to path down here to get divine guidance. Now, this isn't the most impactful node, so there's no reason to rush into lab two, whereas lab one is very, very impactful. This is mostly leading the way to sanctuary of thought, which is very strong. So, you know, you can just, just know you're not going to get a big power spike from lab two. On to the notes section. So in act seven, basically when you do finish acts or when you do finish the second lab, you will have more mana pool. Um, so we're going to have determination. We're likely going to have dropped Herald of Thunder for Arctic armor at this point, and we'll have a pretty high level of clarity, but clarity reserves flat mana as opposed to percentage mana. So there's a quite high likelihood you will have a lot of mana available to be reserved and you can throw on vitality to give us some life regen at this point for act eight there's no notes just cruise through it in act nine i want you to be cognizant of your character level as soon as you hit level 60 i strongly advise that you teleport to heist and start farming chaos orbs there i do have a link to a youtube video with a specific timestamp this was the simulated league start run that we did. And at that timestamp, that is where I start doing the chaos recipe and heist. And you can watch around five minutes. I do give an explanation of how you can be farming chaos orbs effectively in there. I would honestly stay in heist for quite a while. I'm probably gonna farm a six link in heist. It's up to you. You don't need to go to that extent, but it is worth it. You're going to get a lot of levels. You're going to be able to spend the chaos orbs as you get them to make meaningful upgrades. Later in this video, I'm going to be talking about very powerful uniques as well as simply, you know, just a six link and better gear to really leapfrog you into the end game. So this should take a few hours at the very least. And then at some point, once you do a few gear upgrades, you can even go and do your third lab because third lab is pretty hard, but if you do farm heist and get one or two upgrades, it will be a cakewalk. And lab three gives you sanctuary of thought, which gives you a ton of power. So for act 10, yeah, okay. So this note is for lab three. You could choose to drop faster projectiles for added lightning support. Now we were using added lightning in act one, and then we quickly dropped it in act three. But when you drop it, you could put it in your weapon swap and then keep leveling it because added lightning is gonna be in our final links anyways. 
and it scales linearly with levels. So you really do want this to be as high level as possible. And it is a lot of damage when fighting a Zaro because you don't care for faster projectiles in these sort of boss fights anyways. So this is just a little trick to do a Zaro with even very bad gear. You just drop faster projectiles for added lightning. Um, all right, so that is the extent of these notes. I have a little bit of, I'd like an example of the final links you should approximately have when you're at the end of the campaign. So if at any point you just wanna like see, oh, what, what should I have? Um, you can just skip down to the bottom. So just a rough idea. Um, now onto the final passive tree. We can grab some damage down here and then we basically just path up here and grab more damage. That is the extent of the passive tree for the campaign. Now that we've beaten the campaign, it's time to think about the Widow Hail swap. So for the tree, when you swap to Widow Hail, you are gonna take off all these dual wield nodes and grab a little bit more damage, some armor down here. And then we are going into Mind Over Matter with Eldritch Battery, as well as some Energy Shield Leech to keep up our Energy Shield for this transition. You don't have to time your Mind Over Matter Eldritch Battery with the Widow Hail swap. It's just a coincidence that we're doing it at the same time. So we haven't looked at the item sets yet. It's just sort of random items you find in the campaign up until the Widow Hail swap. So here we're going to buy the Widow Hail. We're going to use a very cheap quiver for our first quiver. Rear guard is generally around less than 5 chaos. This gives us full attack block cap, 50%. Chance to sp block spell damage, a lot of flat armor, a ton of projectile speed, and a decent amount of increased damage, but still very little damage on this setup. For the helmet, nothing special. You could opt for a hubris circlet instead of this armor base if you wanted, because for the Eldritch Battery swap, we want to have a decent size energy shield pool. You know, either or. We just have life, some resistances, and I do have an example where we have Fizz taken as fire because this is a really good modifier. It is betrayal only through Corel, and you may or may not have this. You know, just if you do have it, craft it. For body armor, the main thing here is you do want to have some energy shield on the body armor. So either an energy shield base or a hybrid base up to you. This just has life resistances. And again, it does have Fizz taken as Ellie, which this one, you get it from Gravisius in Betrayal. So if you do have that, you can craft it on here to be tankier. If not, you will be slightly less tanky. For gloves, um, you do want to aim to get Pierce in the Implicit and you get this through Eater of Worlds, Ickers. And you can also get a prefix that gives us an additional pierce, and you get that through Betrayal as well. So again, there's three Betrayal crafts here. You may want to involve the Betrayal mechanic in your League Start strategy, or you could just trade for these crafts. Um, oh, I guess I should note here, I will be using global 8686 as my um, spark global chat. So if that catches on, you could probably ask for these crafts in global 8686. I'll probably mention that later on in this video where I talk about spark resources, but that's a good way where you can share something like this. Crowdsource it. That's how I've done it in the past. So for the boots, um, you know, this is just life resistance, nothing else on these. This amulet actually has nothing. I probably should have imported a better amulet. I think this is just, it was just what I, I'd never updated. It's just something I found on the ground. Um, so Call of the Brotherhood is 
good defensively because now suddenly half of our damage is cold, so we're gonna chill and freeze enemies. But it's also important for our damage because we are going to be making use of Trinity support. And you need to have Call of the Brotherhood to make use of this. It will Trinity supports not work unless you have Call of the Brotherhood. Uh, this ring is just life resistances. Doriani's belt, this gives us resistances, some armor, some damage, some strength, and the most important thing is lifesteal. There are many different variants of this belt. If you have Call of the Brotherhood, you can go for the cold damage leached or the lightning damage leached. If you don't have Call of the Brotherhood yet, you need to get lightning damage leached as life. Other ways to get lifesteal in the early game are you can get it on a ring mod that drops in Delve. Similar, it would be lightning damage leashed his life. You could get it from an amulet that drops in Delve. It's also percentage lightning damage leashed his life. You can get it through the temple. I think that would be, it's a hybrid mod, which gives you lightning resistance and lightning damage leashed his life. You could get it on the glove instead of the pierce. That is an option. Uh, for the glove implicit, you could also, um, I think you can get Volico's sign. That also gives us a life leech. That's a ring. So that is the basic Widow Hail swap. Um, and then uh, I'm not going to go through all of the skills. That, like the skills will change for each one of these swaps. After this default swap, the next one is we're gonna do a crit swap and you do this after you finish Uber Lab because with Uber Lab, we are getting Conviction of Power, which gives us 200% increased critical strike chance. It also gives us a lot of Fizz damage mitigation with the endurance charges and a lot of Ellie Res with the endurance charges. So this is the signal we are crit swapping. What crit swap means is you unspec Ellie overload, you grab some crit on the tree here, some crit on the tree here, you get all this power charge stuff up here, an extra power charge down here, and your six link changes. Six link now uses power charge on crit, and you're gonna keep this all the way up until the final tree because the absolute final tree, we are getting power charge generation through Storm Rider. And once you get this, you can drop power charge on crit for a higher damage support. But until then, power charge on crit is actually very high damage. Um, so that is the next step. It's the crit swap, which involves all those things I talked about. Now, the next step would be adding a uh, curse setup which requires us to six link our widow hail bow so that's why this is coming later because now you need a six link unique item which is a lot harder to get than a rare body armor so with this swap we are going to be adding in a ring called anathema which sets our curse limit equal to our maximum power charges, which is gonna be six. We have a curse limit of six. We're only gonna be using five curses. So we're gonna put our curses in the Widow Hail bow. We are gonna be casting them with the Arcanist brand. You're just gonna throw the Arcanist brand on a boss and it's gonna cast Sniper's Mark, Ellie Weakness, Conductivity, Frostbite, and Punishment. I actually should note here that you don't need a six link for this. You could use a five link curse setup and then you would just drop punishment and that would be perfectly fine. This will have a ramp up time of around two and a half seconds. So just keep that in mind. But once everything is ramped up and online, you're going to do a massive amount of damage. So that is the next step. Obviously, in each one of these steps, the gear does progressively get better and the skills may change slightly. So you should be always matching when you wanna make the next jump. Just change the skills, change the items, change the passive tree. We get more skill points as we go up. And then the guide ends with this final Widow Hail tree. And what this signifies is we have crafted 
the rare quiver. So we no longer are using this super like 1C budget rear guard. We have a quiver with, well, right now this is showing six modifiers, but it's actually extremely easy to craft one with five modifiers. So we're gonna segue into how to craft this quiver right after this. So this final tree, this is actually a quite a big respec. As you can see, we go from left-hand side to right-hand side because we are going for suppression as well as evasion for our defenses. We have ghost shroud, which means we want to scale our evasion as high as we can get. It's not too high right now because again, this is still pretty budget. We'll be able to invest more to get it higher. Um, and lightning coil is going to be for when we take hits that come through the evasion. This is going to work in conjunction with our endurance charges to reduce that into a palatable amount of damage. All right, so the premise of this build revolves around the interaction between the Widow Hail bow and the rare quiver we're going to craft. So I better spend a decent amount of time to make sure all of you guys fully understand how this works. This bow has a roll range between 150 to 250% increased bonuses gained from the equipped quiver. Since that's increased, we can add 100% before we do the math. So we would have 243 would become 3.43. Every stat on this quiver gets multiplied by 3.43. So just the implicit alone becomes 3.43 times 30. This implicit is giving us 100% projectile speed, and then we have fractured T2 projectile speed. So that would be 3.43 times 39. So we're getting 230% increased projectile speed from the quiver. And then I rolled this with, I think, T3 crit multi, so I only have 25%, but let's just assume we rolled it with T1. That would give us 41 crit multi. So it would be 41 times 3.43. It's 140% crit multi. For life, I've got 95. So 95 times 3.43, 325 life. Chaos res, we have 33. So 33 times 3.43, it's 113 chaos res. And then there's a lot of flat damage. Um, I don't know how to add this all up. So maybe... 20, 40, 60, maybe around 70, 70 times 3.43, like 240 flat damage. So that's what we're getting from the quiver, and that's how you do the math. Again, this has probably the six modifiers you're going to want to have, which is chaos resistance, essence, crit multi, and then for the prefixes, you want to have life, you're going to want to use the Veiled Orb to get flat hybrid damage, and then you craft on another flat hybrid damage to just get a ton of good stuff. Realistically, the first quiver you're gonna craft, you're not gonna aim for all six modifiers because it is extremely easy to hit five mods. Five mods, cakewalk. So to craft our first quiver, we're gonna wanna have Feathered Arrow Quiver with either a Fractured Suffix, which would be Fractured Chaos Res, or fractured projectile speed, or a fractured prefix, which would be fractured maximum life. If you go for the prefix, you're gonna slam deafening essence of scorn until you hit one other suffix you want. So here it's already hit. You're guaranteed the crit multi. You're trying to hit either projectile speed or chaos res. Um, I don't really have a lot of these, but let's just assume there's Here, there we go, projectile speed right there. Not too hard to hit that. Now we would have to scour off gain life per enemy killed so that you have an open suffix. Like, I don't know if I'll be able to actually do that, but either way, I'm just gonna finish explaining this. Just pretend that projectile speed's still on there. Then you would do suffixes can't be changed. So now 
well, you would have two good suffixes and an open suffix, and then you would go reforge chaos. And since this has suffixes can't be changed, you're going to keep those two suffixes you want. And it's hopefully going to add in uh, chaos res and keep the prefix open. So there we go. I actually got T1 chaos res there, and we solved the open prefix. So now you would have four good modifiers. And then you're going to go do suffixes can't be changed again. And you're going to hit it with a veiled orb. Like this is a veiled chaos orb, but next thing you're going to have a veiled orb. And what the veiled orb is going to do is it's going to remove a prefix and add a veiled modifier. But as you can see right now, we have one prefix that can't be changed because it's fractured and we have crafted suffixes can't be changed. So it has to remove suffixes can't be changed and it'll add in the veiled line. So it'll work like this, exactly like this. And then you're going to want to block something before you unveil. And let's just look at everything you can unveil. For the prefixes, get flat armor and evasion. At this point in the build, we're not really armor stacking. So this is bad. Evasion with maximum energy shield is actually good because we are evasion based and maximum energy shield. You may actually want to unveil this. Maximum life can't get it because it's already fractured. Maximum mana, not good. So you're going to want to block this because everything else is good. Well, except this one. Um, so we're going to block the mana. Uh, what was it? Mana with regenerate life per second. Do I even, do I not have that? I don't know what's going on. Anyways, we're going to block mana. That might, this is still going to work. I don't think you can get two mana rolls on something. So now unveil. And you see, we can unveil some damage. And now you are going to craft on the last thing, which would be um, either evasion with maximum energy shield if you want to be defensive, or if you want more damage, you would craft another one of these damage modifiers. And there you go. Like, technically speaking, this would be six perfect modifiers because. Again, the gain life per enemy killed would have been prod speed. It's just I didn't want to sit here spamming the essences. So, you know, you get the picture, right? That's how you make like perfect six. And if you want to do it to get five, five is extremely cheap. Now, I don't even have any of these essences left, but I can demo it on these fractured suffixes. Um, where are my essences? Let's just spam a random essence. What did this one do? This one could add strength. So just pretend this strength is a crit multi roll. You just hit. You're we're adding crit multi every time, and eventually it's going to hit prod speed. There we go. So now you would have three good suffixes and then you would do suffixes can't be changed and you would veiled chaos orbit. So now you have your three good suffixes. This just happened to give me maximum life, which is just completely like random. So this is actually going to turn out to have six good things, but like just pretend you didn't get that. You see, sometimes when you're trying to craft something that's like just you're aiming for five, you're going to get six anyways. And then we're going to block mana again. And then we're going to unveil. Let's just unveil. This time let's unveil the defensive one here. We'll unveil the defensive one and craft on uh, some flat damage and it can't be to attack it just needs to be the generic flat damage there you go 
So this was supposed to only have five good modifiers, but, uh, well, I mean, yeah, we just got lucky. That is, they're both fairly budget crafts. Um, so yeah, you want to look for either of these fractures and use the Essence of Scorn. That is the crux of this build. And I guess I could note here, if you want a really good quiver, you can go for a synth implicit. So you could have triple synth implicits. The problem with that is you can't have a fractured mod and also have synth implicits. So it is going to be really expensive to actually get six good modifiers. It's still going to be better because you're getting three good modifiers in the implicit. So it might be worth doing that even early on if you can afford a good synth base. But these will treat you more than fine. These are very, very strong quivers that you can craft for a budget. For our Pantheons, we have a little bit of flexibility, so let's go over our options. On a League Start, you're 100% going to want to start on Soul of Brian King because it solves stuns, and you're going to want to capture Mervail as fast as possible because we don't naturally get ailment immunity, and this is going to solve for the worst of the ailments. Um, you could opt to use Purity of Elements in a League Start scenario, and eventually we are going to transition to the Jewel combined with Crafted Boots, but I do think Soul of Brian King just makes sense right off the bat. As for the Minor God, you could go for Soul of Yugle. This is pretty good. Reducing Curses is going to help us be quite a lot more survivable, especially if you couple that with either... 30% reduced effect can also come on a rare jewel. Maybe you could get a Corrupted Blood Immunity Jewel that has that. Or you could opt for a Flask Suffix with reduced effect of curses. Another benefit of Solo Yugle is it gives you 50% reduced reflected damage, which is useless by itself. But if you're the type of person that likes to run as many map mods as possible, you can opt to unspec something on the tree to grab these three nodes, which opens up the mastery 60% reduced reflected elemental damage taken. And when you combine that with Solo Yugle, you are fully immune to reflect. Now, for the minor gods, if you are gonna do the Searing Exarch altars, obviously you're gonna have to choose the Soul of Abarath. That's just assumed. And once you graduate off the of Soul of Brian King, you could opt for Lunaris or Solaris. I think in general, Solo Lunaris is probably better for mapping. Although this past league, uh, Solo Solaris was good because of the reduced area damage taken and uh, it's helping to mitigate crits. So probably one of these two. If you are not doing the red altars and you also don't care too much about reflect immunity um you'd probably want to get one with fizz damage reduction solo tukahama is okay solo growth is okay you are there's a little bit of flexibility but that's my insight on how i would choose them All right, it's getting late. This video is kind of long and I still have to record all the budget uniques you guys can use on day one as options. I still have to talk about intermediate uniques and then the chase uniques that you want if you want to push this build really far. So I'm not going to record any new B-roll footage. You guys get the joy of watching me farm heist in SSF on a four link with a really, really garbage gear which you guys are probably gonna do, but you guys are gonna be spending your money as you find it, so you guys will have a much better character to do this than I did. All right, so first up, let's talk about Kliss's Grace. These gloves are probably gonna be dirt cheap. They are a five link, because they give us faster casting, which is very good. They have decent stats on them. If these are dirt cheap and you don't have a five link, go for this and use this while probably doing the same content you're watching right now. You know, pre-Katava heisting, just a five link. It'll make it faster. You'll farm your chaos faster, but you will want to graduate into a proper six link and you will be able to farm it fairly easy on softcore trade. Next up, 
Velocco sign. This is a very budget way to get life steal. Just keep in mind, you need to shock the enemies. And normally you would need to crit an enemy to shock them. So if you do use this, either you still have to be on the Orb of Storm setup because that will inflict shocks. Or better yet, you want to be pushing to make that crit swap because crits are guaranteed shocks. But this is not really ideal. This is truly like a 1C item that you just throw on for a little bit of life steal. Okay, this next item is likely going to be a little bit expensive, especially if this build pops off. So Doriani's Invitation Heavy Belt. This drops from Aziri. There are four different variants and we can use two of them. So you want to look for either Cold Damage Leached as Life or Lightning Damage Leached as Life. It also gives armor, which is really good for early on. We are going to be armor based at this point still. Gives us a bunch of resistances, some strength. Everything about this is very good. Next up, Singularity Scepter. Now it is possible that high rolled Widow Hills are going to be expensive on League Start. We don't know yet. We don't know what other builds are using the Widow Hill. We don't know how many people are going to be trying to buy it at the same time. Singularities start off probably like 10 hours into the league. These are going to be, I'm going to guess, 10 chaos or less. And very quickly, they're going to drop to 1 to 2 chaos because these are common. You can dual wield these and do a ridiculous amount of damage. So you can just keep faster projectiles on your links and then run with double singularities, you will do a shit ton of damage. The downside is that rear guard, while it doesn't give a lot of damage, it does give defenses. So this is going to be more glass cannon. But if your defenses still feel fine for the content you're doing, this will probably be faster than a Widow Hail with the rear guard because you're going to do crazy amounts of damage with two of these. And on my loot filter, once you hit the level where these can be chanced into singularities, you will start seeing tiny platinum scepters that you can pick up to chance yourself. Just keep in mind, if you are doing the recommended heisting strategy, you do need to use your chance orbs to buy the contracts as well. So you can't be spending them all trying to chance a singularity. Next up, Call of the Brotherhood. Now, this is important for if you are using trinity support as soon as you pick up call of the brotherhood you should add on trinity support to your build it is a huge amount of damage call of the brotherhood is also a lot of defense because it converts half of our damage to cold and then the cold is going to help freeze and chill enemies especially after we've done the crit swap All right as for intermediate uniques replica dragons Light is going to be hard to beat. This is going to give us plus three levels to spark. Spark skills very well with levels. Elemental resistances are nice. Mana reservation efficiency is nice. And also reducing attributes requirements is nice because we scale our strength in our decks only to meet those attribute requirements. So if we have a Replica Dragon's Fang Flight, this will ease the pressure on our attributes. Keep in mind, you cannot divine this. If you divine it, it's going to change the spark skill gems to a different thing. So if you buy one, you are just stuck with that, assuming you bought the one that gives plus three to spark. Um, another intermediate one is another core piece of the build, which is the Anathema Moonstone Ring. We've already talked about this, but this gives you uh, a curse limit equal to power charges. And we get four power charges from our ascendancy and we can get two extra ones on the tree which gives us a curse limit of six and uh yeah we will be using that with uh arcanist brand to give us a lot of damage for single targets once we get into the later stages of the league start progression we're going to want to get ailment immunity through the storm shroud jewel in conjunction with a crafted pair of rare boots. There is gonna be a crafting guide on the channel. In fact, there already is one. I'm simply gonna put it in a playlist for Widow Hail Spark, and that playlist is gonna be easily accessible in any of my update videos. So you can just click on the playlist and you'll find all the relevant content if you are following this build guide. Another intermediate option is Mutable Force Jewel, this completely mitigates stuns, and once we transition away from armor into evasion, you will be getting stunned a little bit, 
you could either go for Brian King, Pantheon to get uh, some sort of stun mitigation for free. If that doesn't feel like it's good enough, this would be the more extreme option. Um, the final thing I want to talk about here is Watcher's Eye. We want to aim for chance to evade attack hits while affected by Grace. And if you want to splurge a little bit, you could get another damage modifier. There are too many to list, but you can look them up. Moving on to the chase uniques. First one I want to talk about is Forbidden Flame and Flesh. I think there are some very good options available. I haven't included any in this lead start path of building because I truly believe these are simply luxury options. The first one I want to talk about is the Inquisitor node Inevitable Judgment, which gives us critical strikes, ignore enemy monster resistances. It's quite easy to crit cap on Hierophant so we can get full use out of this. And this will free up our six link curse setup, which is primarily used to reduce enemy resistances as well as free up our ring slot because we no longer need to use Anathema to stack these curses. This lets us sub in very powerful unique rings such as Death Rush, among other options. And uh, yeah, it's just a lot of power right there. Another advantage of this is all this penetration is instant, whereas using the Arcanus brand, you do need to ramp up the curses because the Arcanus brand has to cast cast each curse on the monster before you get that extra damage. Another option would be the Guardian node on Wavering Crusade, which summons Elemental Relic if you hit an enemy. And Spark just covers the screen. You get so many Sparks that you are always going to have all the Elemental Relics, which give us high level of Wrath, which we benefit fully from. A high level of hatred, which we get half effect because we use Call of the Brotherhood, but only one of them. And then a high level of anger, which gives us a lot of flat fire damage, which is quite nice to have. A third option would be another Inquisitor one, Righteous Providence, which gives us increased critical strike chance per point of strength and intelligence, whichever one is lower, as well as giving us a flat 50 to strength and to intelligence. So this will help cap crits. So we'll be able to scale back our crit chance elsewhere. I'd say this is possibly a little bit less powerful than the other two, depending on your setup. The other obvious chase uniques are Headhunter and Mageblood. I think they're both very good on the build. I would lean towards Mageblood personally because I like, I just prefer Mageblood in general, unless I'm on a magic find build that requires the Headhunter simply to function, uh, that's just my preference. You get a lot of movement speed, you get a lot of defense, and it just makes the build much more flexible because you can solve so many issues with the mage blood. Well, you made it to the end of the video. and Wow, this was a long one. Hopefully I've made you excited to leave start Widow Hill Spark with me. And I suppose this is the point of the video where I should redirect you to some additional content. Now, what we're looking at right here is the Widow Hill Spark content playlist, which is looking pretty barren at the moment, but I will be adding to it as I make more videos. You can find this in the description of any upcoming video. Right now, this video in particular is quite important. The SSF Lee Start Run, which just shows an uncut run in SSF. And this is going to showcase a few things. First off, it's showcasing a live split racer overlay that was made specifically for Spark. If you do want to use this on your League Start, you can go down into the video description of this particular League Start run. A leveling overlay. There's a post on Reddit showing how you can install it. It's made by Never Scrywolf. He's a community member that made this Spark overlay specifically for a build. This Leaf Start Run is also going to showcase the leveling filter I use. It's going to do a bunch of stuff like showcase. Well, it's going to highlight four links that we might want to use, the proper colors. It's going to hide some rare items that we definitely don't want. It is calibrated for the chaos recipe that I suggest we do that you'll see later on in this run. There's timestamps here. We're doing Chaos Recipe. 
This chaos recipe also involves a program overlay, which can also be found in the description. So here's the chaos recipe enhancer. And to get the loot filter, you also find it down there. This just links to my public profile and you're going to want to choose AP leveling spark Templar. And this should carry you well into red maps. It's calibrated to change as you get further on, to hide more and more stuff. Eventually, I'm going to be personally switching to Anime Princess Ultra Strict. This is not calibrated right now, but I will be customizing this before the league start. I'm going to make it a little bit less strict. And as the league progresses, it will get progressively more and more strict. This is simply my personal filter. It's up to you if you want to use this, but I would suggest using the leveling filter. All right. Another resource is my uh, Discord channel, which has 2000 players. All of them have played Spark before, and a lot of the new players who are going to be playing Widowhill Spark are going to join this Discord. It's a good place to meet friends. If you have any questions, someone in here will probably know the answer. You can, you know, share some build ideas in here. It's just a good place to, for the community to gather. Now, my Twitch profile, I work full time, but I also stream whenever I'm playing the game. I'm on the East Coast in North America, so you can expect me live on Twitch probably in the afternoons or evenings. And if that doesn't work out for you, but you still want to catch what's happening, I do have a second channel called Anime Princess VODs. In the past, I used to just directly upload my VODs here. I didn't do it last league. One issue I had doing this was that by downloading it off of Twitch and then re-uploading it, it lost a lot of quality. So what I'm planning on doing this upcoming league is I'm going to be recording directly through OBS so I can upload in like perfect 1440p quality to this channel, you're going to see the VODs crystal clear. And I think I'm going to take the POB from right when the VOD ends and I'm going to calibrate it so you can see exactly my damage, my defense. You see all my stats of the character on that day. So this will be a nice way, like say you, you want to see what my character looked on day four, you just click on day four you open the path of building and you can see the gameplay associated with the path of building. So that's my plan for this channel in the upcoming league. And that wraps up this guide. Hope you all enjoyed the video and I will catch you all in the next one. Peace.